Okay, a warm welcome to everyone who's watching us um, online and live. Um, I, I'm sorry about uh, the delay in uh, coming on air. Uh, we've had some technical issues, but I hope everyone can follow us and hear us well. Uh, first of all, um, thank you for your, all your active participation in our MOOC. We really enjoyed reading your, your posts and comments, mm -hmm. and, and we've been inspired and challenged by your questions. And I can just say that we have learned as much from you as probably you might have um, from, uh, from us. And it's always an, a really great experience reading yeah. through the posts um, that, that you um, uh, leave on, on, on Future Learn on the platform and, and all the great tasks that you have developed. They are really interesting. And it's also very interesting to learn about the different contexts that you Absolutely. work in. We have teachers more around the world. So. Yes, yes. And then you have been also great in supporting each other uh, when you have questions. Mm. So, um, we've been collecting questions in, um, in week four, and we go to, we've tried to group the questions uh, around thematic areas, and we'll try to address those questions that we received in writing first. But um, hopefully we'll have uh, questions for, uh, for, we'll have time for questions that come in uh, live um, and we will be able to answer those. Okay, um, and the questions that we received um, are to do with teacher training, teaching specific aspects of language from very low level skills such as spelling and pronunciation to higher level skills such as reading, we received questions about um, learning strategies um, and multilingual classrooms, and we also received questions about family support. family support and teaching languages other than English. So these are the topics that we'll go through and we'll try to address your mm -hmm. questions to the best of our knowledge. So shall we start with one about teacher training? So there's a question about um, whether the topic of SBLDs actually is covered in teacher training. Um, the question really is asking about a UK context, but perhaps you could elaborate on that. Yes, um, when they're in the UK there are different types of teacher training courses. One of them is the postgraduate certificate in education that teachers who teach in primary and secondary schools are uh, in further education colleges. They, yeah. they usually take that um, route to, in teacher training. And I originally thought that it was required by the law to include something on specific uh, learning difficulties and special needs, but Anne Margaret seems I'm to not, think I'm not otherwise. sure it's a legal requirement, but not yet. But um, in practice, there is usually some component, but it's very short mm. most of the time. And then there is another sector of teacher training in the UK, which is then also exported um, uh, overseas. And these are the diploma and, and certificate courses for English language teacher training, such as Delta and, and CELTA. Um, now, Delta, the diploma level, the higher level course, has an optional module on special needs. The CELTA, it doesn't seem to have so much training. I haven't come across any CELTAs that have got any SBLD components in. Unless, oh, you know, if the trainer is very interested in the subject, they might include something. Yeah. Uh, and in Europe, um, there would be, um, we're both participants um, to different levels in the DISTAFO project, which initiated some change. And in Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Germany, there are already courses at university level mm -hmm. that incorporate um, as training on SBLDs for language teachers. In Latin America, um, to my knowledge, there isn't um, so much because we had quite a lot of participants who were doing their teacher training while taking our Future Learn course. So it mm -hmm. seems to indicate that there isn't a lot of training available. Um, so that's how far our expertise in this regard uh, uh, spreads. But I think it's important to say uh, something that was stressed uh, in this live stream session, but also we've stressed it uh, in the course, that um, the general good teaching practice uh, and, an, and an inclusive ethos or an inclusive uh, set of mind from, from on the part of the teacher is very helpful in general. Mm. And I think in EFL training, so the CELTA and the DELTA that you mentioned, generally there is that inclusive ethos 
already in, in the course. And although it may not be explicitly pointed out, this is good for students with SPLDs, actually, teachers who go through that route do come out with a good sense of how to include quite a range of students. So. Yes, while we believe it's very important that language teachers or teachers of any subject um, are familiar with what SVLDs are, what challenges students with SVLDs face, and how you can create an inclusive classroom and how you can support these students, and I think there is still a lot to do in, in this so so work to do. Yeah. Um, all right, um, the next question, which is still kind of a more general question that we uh, receive, um, is about self-confidence. Yeah, well, I think confidence is a massive issue for students with SBLDs. Um, the, the question that was asked does kind of suggest that the teacher who asked this has come across students who have quite low self-esteem because they've experienced quite a lot of failure one way or another in their educational experience. Um, and I've certainly come across that. I don't know if you have as well. Yes, 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 very often students um, come with low levels of self-confidence. Mm, and not really believing that they can learn a language. Um, so the question is, what advice do we have um, to help students to overcome this, this initial barrier? Um, there is a lot we can do, actually. First of all, just showing that we actually do believe in the student. We believe that they can learn. I've come across students who have been told by teachers that they will never learn a language. And that, that's really horrible. That's hard for them then to, to get over. But if we show that we do believe in them, that goes a long way. Obviously, we can praise them and um, tell them that they're doing a good job. But sometimes it's hard for them to believe they're doing a good job. So we can set up activities to um, help them experience success, an activity which is perhaps just at their proficiency level so that they do succeed and they do experience what success is like. But I think this goes also to self-awareness and if we can get students to start reflecting on their own learning, um, and I, I don't just mean, you know, did you get it right, did you get it wrong, but going deeper and thinking, how did I do, how did I manage that task, what did I do well, how did I get over any challenges that I experienced. When they start to reflect like that, they start to see, actually, I have got strategies. And if they look back through their learning history, they'll see that they have made progress. Um, and I think that's a much more sort of concrete way of helping them to, to realize that they can learn and so boost their, their confidence and their motivation to carry on learning. Thank you, and Margaret, I think that's a great suggestion. <laughs> Hopefully that covers that. Okay. Shall we go on to this question about Teaching spelling? Yes, teaching spelling and pronunciation. So the question about the phonemic chart, there's been a few questions about using the phonemic chart as a teaching tool. Um, the phonemic chart is basically the 44 symbols from the IPA which represent sounds from what we might call uh, British Standard English except that obviously it doesn't cover all varieties of British English. Um, I, I think I told you I was doing um, a ph phonology training session in Scotland and the teachers just laughed because they didn't see the symbols that represented their variety of English. So the phonemic chart, it, it can be a good start. Um, I think a lot of the teachers who asked these questions were afraid that having too many symbols would be confusing for students with SBLD, and I think there's certainly some truth in that. Students who are particularly coming to the Latin alphabet as a second alphabet, having to learn these new, um, the letters of the Latin alphabet, that is a lot of new symbols that they have to learn anyway, without having to learn these 44 symbols from the um, phonemic chart. But I think there is a place for it in, in language teaching because um, one of the problems with English, as we know, is that the sounds can be represented in different ways with different letters, different combinations of letters, whereas the phonemic chart gives each sound one symbol. And for students, I think particularly students who have autistic traits, that can be quite reassuring to know this sound is just, is just you know, one symbol and vice versa. There is that one-to-one -one correlation, which is quite reassuring. And I also use it sometimes to help students to distinguish between sounds um, that they might have difficulty hearing, like the voiced and unvoiced um, vowels or voiced and unvoiced consonants like 
um, th and th in English, both written th, but sometimes it can be hard to hear it. So if you show students the symbols and show that actually they are different, different symbols, it gives them a visual identity that they can hang on to. Um, and yeah, so it, it does have its uses, but we need to be a bit cautious. And I would never ask my students to learn all 44 symbols. Or test them on it. Or <laughs> test them on it, no, it happens. Um, but I might have it up on the wall so that it's there for them to refer to. And it's a useful tool, I mean, they might see it in dictionaries. Yeah, how to pronounce a word, and, and also remember how to pronounce a word when they go home. And although now we have all these uh, speaking dictionaries online that they will pronounce the word for the, for the students. But, but I, I, as a beginner learner of English many, many years ago, I remember that we used it and I found it useful. I think it has its uses, yeah. But it's like all of these things and everything that we've been talking about over the last four weeks, it depends on your learner. <laughs> so it's about getting to know the learner, getting to know what they can cope with and what they need help with, really. So, okay. so um, moving on to spelling. Yes. Um, we had a really interesting question about um, the role of spelling in, um, in teaching spelling, uh, mm -hmm. in working mm -hmm. with dyslexic students. And I think the question comes from the recommendation that, that, that if you know, the written form of language is not very important for the student, then maybe we shouldn't put so much emphasis on spelling or correct, or t we shouldn't assess correct spelling, or there should be um, an accommodation for the student that when they write an essay, their spelling is not assessed. Um, and, uh, on the one hand, I think I, I would agree with these suggestions. They, they work in a certain context. But at the same time, I think it, it might not be um, the best option to ignore teaching spelling entirely, mm -hmm. um, even though it's difficult for the students. So first of all, I think that just because something is difficult, we, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't teach it. Mm -hmm. um, but but as, as um, um, the student who asked, or the participant who asked this question, seeing the print of foreign words uh, is, is helpful, and seeing the spelling is helpful. And there are many reasons why this can be helpful. Spelling helps to develop what we call phonological awareness. So if you learn how to spell a word, your, your ability to translate sounds into letters develops. And that actually helps you remember words better. And we know it in, in child language uh, acquisition research, um, that if children know how to spell the words, their knowledge of vocabulary will become richer and, and they will memorize words better. But it also helps reading mm -hmm. because, you know, it, if you know how to spell a word when you uh, see it, then you recognize it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that there is a, a, a value in, in teaching spelling. Of course, not at the expense of other skills. And then I would you know, leave it up to the teacher how they assess spelling mm -hmm. and whether it's necessary to assess spelling with, with a dyslexic child. Yeah. Yeah. Again, or, or a dyslexic mm -hmm. student. Dyslexic adult. Or a dyslexic yeah. adult, depending on really the purposes for which they can use the language, because mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, that really depends. Um, mm -hmm. So, and similarly, um, somebody is asking about grammar and whether teaching grammar explicitly is necessary. Let's give you one more. Well, I would say yes, but I would actually advocate that teaching grammar explicitly is necessary almost for everybody. Um, that's what recent research in the field of um, language, second language acquisition suggests, that, that explicit teaching of grammar is helpful for everybody. And again, there are many reasons for this. First of all, grammar of any language is quite complex, usually, for the students to be able to figure it out entirely by themselves. Unless, of course, they are very young and they are completely immersed into that environment. Um, but certain regularities are really difficult to notice. Some of them don't actually occur so frequently in the input that the students hear, for example, the third conditional. If I had known it, I would have done it differently. You know, maybe they don't encounter it so frequently. Mm -hmm. So, and there are exceptions. And, and I think it is just much more efficient and quicker if we help mm -hmm. with some explicit teaching. And that doesn't mean that I'm advocating that we should you know, go back to the present the grammar rule practice and then produce um, the, the language kind of teaching. But I think it's important for teachers to 
kind of direct students' attention to mm. grammatical forms in, uh, in reading or when they watch a film or they, they listen to text, um, highlight it or make it more salient. And then um, helping them to discover what is the regularity, what is, what is the rule. And that actually applies not only to grammar, but also, for example, spelling, because we say English spelling is so irregular and so exceptional. That's not entirely true. There are lots of regularities in English spelling, mm -hmm. which is, we just don't teach them. We assume that the students would, would discover them by themselves. And, and, and students uh, who have learning difficulties find it difficult to learn implicitly. That is kind of just from the input, just without mm -hmm. an explanation. So I think it's important to help them figure out those rules and, and make them little detectives who yes. will find out uh, why something is happening. And I'm, again, I'm not advocating very complex explanations on why something is happening. And then some practice and, 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 and regular kind of practice is really important for the students so that they memorize and automatize that language because maybe they know, yes, this is how we, how we use this grammatical construction or this is the context we use it, but that doesn't mean that when they are put in that context, they won't be able to use it, so they need to practice a little bit more. And then feedback and correction is very important as well. So explicit feedback. Explicit feedback, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and then maybe just, again, accompany it with a little bit of explanation. Do you remember this is because? Mm -hmm. And, and I think, again, we can use lots of multi-sensory ways in, in, in the discovery activities and also in practice activities. Mm. Okay. So, teaching reading. We got a really complex question yes. about teaching reading. So, and margaret will try to summarize that question. Okay. So, this is a question about students who have already developed language and they can, they've got quite a good level of oral language so they can speak English basically um, but their literacy practices haven't developed at the same speed so the question basically is asking how do we help those students to catch up in their literacy practices with their, their higher level of oral language um, would we use a, a very structured spelling program or you know what would we do to, to help students to sort of balance up their, their different skills. Um, first thing obviously to say is it depends on the student, it depends on the situation. But I mean there are a number of things that we can do. This is a situation which I have come across quite a lot and actually um, those of you who have been following the course and watched the video of um, the teacher with the two little girls, that program has been used with older learners so they had, they could speak English to some degree, but that teacher actually took them back. So these were like teenagers, took them back to the beginning and um, took them through the phonics aspect of the program. Now, obviously they knew quite a lot of the vocabulary, so they could move quite quickly. In a way, that was a great thing because it gave them a lot more confidence. It, you know, kind of made them see that actually they had already learned quite a lot of English and they just needed the confidence to use it. But it also kind of took apart the language that they had and helped them to see the sort of nuts and bolts of it and then put it back together in order to progress with their, with their literacy practices. So that is one approach which can work if you've got a student who's willing to go with you on that. Because I have also come across students who are not really willing to go back and they say, no, no, I already know that. I don't need to go back to the beginning. Um, it depends. What their, what their first alphabet is, if they've developed literacy in another language, whether they're willing to um, go back and look at the Latin alphabet in detail and match sounds to those letters. Another approach which is used quite a lot in ESOL in the UK, which is adult education for people who are settled in a, an English-speaking country, is to use the language experience approach where um, quite often we find students who don't have literacy practices in their first language they have learned to speak English to some extent. And what the teacher does then is to take the student's language, so they get the student to produce language, and the, the teacher records it. And then that written language becomes the basis of the teaching the literacy practices. So the sentences get chopped up into words. The student obviously um, has to rearrange them to make the sentence. And so it's almost like sight learning in a way. 
Um, and that does seem to be quite effective, again, in, in particular situations. Um, it's quite hard without knowing the particular student you're thinking about. But there are a range of activities out there which you, know, you could explore and see what works for your student. I'm afraid it's going to be the, the refrain, always, isn't it? Always going to come back to that, what works for your student. So hopefully that's given some pointers on that one. Um, the other really interesting question we had um, was about strategy training, metacognitive strategies, and how to use metacognitive strategies with students whose level proficiency level of English was quite low, so that a discussion about their thought processes in English would be quite challenging. Um, this was from somebody who teaches multilingual classes. Yeah. My, my suggestion, my first suggestion would be if you're lucky enough and if you've got um, the same nationalities and the same language groups represented in your classroom, then let them do it in their first language. Let them work in groups and let them okay. discuss their thought processes and strategies and exchange ideas, what works for you, what works for me, why they want to try this. And I, I think there is a, really a room for using one's first language in the classroom. It's a very important supportive tool. Um, and if you can use it for that purpose, mm. then I think that's, that's uh, uh, really helpful. My other suggestion would have been to, um, to teach some of the key words that you need to be able to um, do metacognitive reflections, such as if you're talking about general learning strategies, such as planning, schedule, revise, or if you're talking about really specific cognitive strategies, like figure out, guess, uh, chop up mm. um, and then ask the student after you've told those words ask the students to to use those as they reflect in their, in their so actually give them the vocabulary they need yes. in order to to have that discussion yeah, yeah and, and it may well be worth actually investing the time in doing that because that process of um, unraveling your own thought processes is so valuable isn't it in language learning and it's so much easier if you can do it as part of a discussion in a group. So it might well be worth investing some time actually in, in developing that language to enable yes. them to do that. And in higher education, because now, now there's my experiences in higher education, I find that, um, that these next six students who are very well aware of their own strengths and weaknesses and how they like to learn and how they are most efficient are, are, the, are the most successful learners. And, and, and we do have very successful uh, dyslexic students in higher education who've got this really elaborate range of, of strategies mm -hmm. um, that they use to assist with their reading, writing their essays. So I, I do think that it's important that the students get to know themselves and what, what works for them. Um, I think self-awareness is the key, isn't it? Um, and I mentioned self-awareness before in, in connection to um, confidence but the self-awareness about how I learn um, what kind of things I find difficult that kind of thing you know and then what strategies can I use to get around those difficult areas yeah I think self-awareness is definitely the key um, and I think peer awareness too uh, because if we can develop in our classrooms a kind of learning community where students are happy to support each other and work together I think everybody gains from that. Um, they pick up strategies from each other, but also when they recognise that there's something that they have a bit of a barrier with, they know who to go with, you know, to talk to and, and to work with on something. So yeah, I think self-awareness and raising awareness of each other's yeah. strengths yeah, and weaknesses. Yeah. I think that's a really good, important point. And also just to say that um, Margaret Crombie, who you will have met if you followed the course and you will have seen her, um, talking about IT, she ha has written a really interesting book that's a few years ago now, um, but she had some really useful metacognitive strategy activities in the book, so look out for that or go to her website, which I think the link is actually in the course, yeah. isn't it? So, uh, Margaret Crombie might be the person to, to ask about that. And actually, relating to our next question, the teaching of foreign languages to mm. uh, other foreign languages other than English to, to uh, students who have learning difficulties, 
Uh, I think, again, Margaret Crombie's website is the page to go to uh, because she's got a lot of resources. But um, we, we received requests about teaching German in particular and some other languages. But uh, in general, I would say that, that I think you can transfer a lot of what you learned in this course about English to other languages. Mm. Um, but I thought I'll show you a few things I prepared with, with some, some pictures. Um, and because one of the um, participants asked about how the diff use of different colors can uh, help students remember the gender of, of German nouns, which is a bit yeah. of a challenge. And the gender issue comes back in French as well, where uh, um, there is grammatical gender and it's really difficult to kind of guess the gender of, of nouns. So I've prepared some, some visual aids that might be helpful for students. I'm not really good at drawing, so you could have done that with the drawing, but I downloaded some, some pictures. So this is a man writing on a tish, on, on a table, which is their, their tish in German. Okay, so what I have done, I have consistently color-coded there, the, the masculine as blue. Maybe it's just culture for me, but for me, blue is always associated with masculine, but again, that can depend on the culture. So you can discuss it with the students when you first start, what color you will use for the masculine one. I have highlighted uh, the T in capital so that the students don't forget that in, in, uh, in German, the, the nouns always have to be spelled with a capital letter. And I also added a photograph of a man typing on a tish okay so that's something that you can do you can either ask the students to imagine a man each time you teach a new word then just stop for a moment and then they say now this is this is masculine imagine something that you associate with being masculine okay and it can be just an image of a man someone boxing some other stereotypical uh, <laughs> images okay then i've got a similar thing for for Das Fenster, which is uh, which has got the neutral um, gender, and I have a um, uh, which is a window. So I've got a girl, and a girl in German is das Mädchen. Okay, it has got the same same um, same um, same gender. So that again helps you to remember. And for me, kind of green was the neutral color. Okay, so that's that's something that you can do. And then I've got the same thing for for the lamp, which is a lamp, and then there is a lady standing under a lamp um, mm -hmm. on, in the rain. And again, that's red for me, and then that helps. And then you can do different games, like like uh, students miming something that they associate with, with something that is masculine, something which is more feminine, and there are lots of ways to, to practice this. Mm -hmm. um, another example I wrote, is, is, is to do with word building because in German words tend to be quite long, okay? And this is one of those words, which is um, okay? which means probability, okay? And students might find it difficult to, to I mean, any student, not just students who have uh, dyslexia, might find it difficult to kind of learn all these long words, especially if they are English speakers and the words tend to be a lot shorter. But in German, we can chop up the words. Uh, and that will help remember. So I've chopped up this word, bar, meaning true, and then shine, which means it has got two meanings, as uh, seem or light, and then lich, which is an, an, a typical uh, uh, suffix, and then kite, which is another suffix. So you can help the students by chopping up these um, components of the word um, and actually teaching them explicitly what they mean and, um, and then also associate it with some some pictures so that the students can remember. And I think this this uh, morphological training actually is really, really helpful. And we do it in English as well. Um, because when you have a very a very long word like this, it's scary, it's, isn't it? When yeah, you see you've yeah. got like 20 letters, or it's really scary. But if you can help students to see, actually, it is just small chunks of things which are familiar. They can see the ending is familiar. I know what that word what that means, what that signifies, that's a lot more accessible, isn't it? Yeah, and then just related to this, in German there are again lots of rules uh, on how um, the gender is assigned to a noun. So for example, everything always ending in kite is always feminine. So that's something again, that it's worth pointing out to the students. Yeah. And then finally, I've got some, a little bit of grammar explanation with, with color coding for you. So this is um, uh, German word order. 
Um, the Lampe State of the Fish, the lamp stands, is standing on the table. Again, each uh, part of the sentence is color coded in different colors. And then you can demonstrate that in, English, in, in German, there is a different word order. So if you, you move the, um, the place, um, the, this is called the, um, the prepositional phrase, to the beginning of the sentence, then the word order will change, unlike in English. So you, have, you can then illustrate it with an arrow. And you can also get the students to do it with the with cuisine arrows. I don't have arrows. Yeah, yeah, I don't have cuisine arrows now with me, but I have strolls. So you can have the lamp state of the dish, and then if I want to change it, then of the dish state the lamp. Okay, and then the students can have these using arrows or straws or Lego, uh, uh, piece, Lego of pasta, piece, of, piece of pasta, whatever, whatever they're yeah. using, something concrete. Yeah, yeah. And then you can do the same thing with, with another type of sentence with more advanced learners. Um, S is good, it is good, du bist here, you are here. And then when we want to combine it, it is good that you are here. Then again, we have to pay attention to the fact that this word here, du bist, comes to the end of the sentence. And again, we can we highlight it with arrows, with different colors, and then we can use again the using arrows, like this is one of the sentence orders, like this, and then, sorry, this is the other one, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and then if I want to use a verb with thus, then, uh, then this one, the verb, has to come to the very end, okay, so now let's change the position of the verb, and I make sure that it's always the last in the sentence, okay. Um, so that's that's just to illustrate that whatever we yeah. are showing with English, you can easily apply. It Absolutely, and we, you know, we can do the same thing with English questions. Presumably, also with French. French is extremely rusty. My, my French is I'm very looking around. <laughs> I'm looking around the room now to see if there are any French speakers in the room. No, everyone shaking hands. Okay. The same principles hold, really, basically, yeah. Yeah. on all languages. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we are now moving to more general uh, questions, and one of them was about parents and support. And whether parents should help or should let the students be more independent at home. Yeah, I thought this was quite an interesting question. Um, in my experience, I've always found that students whose parents are on board and are working with the teachers tend to do better. That parent teacher teamwork really, really helps the student, it gives a consistent message. Um, it means that there are more people keeping an eye on them and seeing how they're getting on, supporting them. Um, I just, yeah, I do think that parents and teachers need to work together quite closely. Now, um, I, I don't know if the question is asking really whether parents should be making the children do the homework and, and kind of getting involved with that side. And I wouldn't ever suggest that parents, you know, when the children get home, they start drilling them. <laughs> Because I think the school can be quite a difficult situation for students with specific learning differences, or college for that matter. And so when they get home, what they need is a bit of time to relax, to recover, to, um, to digest what they've been doing during the day. Um, and that, that's where maybe parents can get involved with supporting the students. Again, helping with self-confidence, self-esteem, um, but also maybe getting involved with things like um, reinforcing memory strategies. If they're, if they're doing memory strategies at school, maybe the parents could help them in their sort of domestic routine, introducing some memory strategies. Organisational strategies, of course, very important at home as well as at school. Um, and I, I think it's perhaps more the emotional and the sort of soft learning skills that parents could support with, rather than um, the drilling. <laughs> You know, I know some parents do feel that they need to get involved, and sometimes it can be helpful for children to have their parent with them when they're doing the homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not a parent, but yeah, yeah I think what is if you have young children, what is important is reading stories to them when mm -hmm. they are young, discussing those stories, why certain things were happening, what what the children think about the stories, what they were the words, because these stories, if you read, they have a lot of vocabulary. So, what do these words mean? And then maybe asking next day, do you remember that word? What was that word? Um, also discussing 
things that have happened to them, things, asking children to summarize what they have seen on TV, um, you know, because in the oral, oral language, or, oral language yeah. because it's also important to, you know, be, to be able to summarize what has happened to them or what, what they have seen, or, and then think about why that things have happened. Um, so I think these, these kinds of um, um, oral literacy skills are, are very important, and they are an important foundation for the development of, of mental literacy skills. Yeah. And, and in terms of research, we, we, it's not just experience, but there is an ample uh, um, amount of research on, on how important role parents play in, in yeah. students' education, again, regardless of learning. And, and for, for students who have learning difficulties, what is important also is the teacher-parent co co collaboration mm -hmm. and, and, and having access to how the child feels at, at the school, how they perform, and, and then how that affects what is happening at home and vice versa. Um, and you can find lots of useful information on this in the Irish Dyslexia Association site. They have a really nice web page with uh, it's really sound advice on, on what dyslexia, the parents of dyslexic mm -hmm. children can do and um, joining local dyslexia organizations. Yeah, I think more and more local dyslexia associations are recognizing that actually the parents need some kind of support too. Um, support parents need guidance and emotional support. Uh, and there are more and more local groups being set up. So if you are a parent, it's it's a great idea to look for other parents in the area who have got a similar situation. Um, families can support each other, and um, yeah, and and then also the websites of these organisations often have very useful pointers. So yeah, it's a good starting point, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if we have any questions online. Oh, we we do one. Okay. Book, recommendation for, book recommendations for all the dyslexic learners. I, I wonder so if they're meeting or, or is it textbooks. course rooms or uh, uh, course books or activities? I think. Activities. Yeah, activities for use with older learners. Okay, activities for adult learners. I think we had this. We were. This was on our reserve list. <laughs> well, what can I say? I normally work with adults, um, and I have been putting together a collection of activities which is coming out um, this month or next month. So check the ELT Well website. What can I say? <laughs> there is a book coming out of activities that you can use in the classroom um, to incorporate into the curriculum that you're already following, uh, which will help students obviously to develop their language skills, but also to develop things like memory strategies, organisation, um, phonological awareness and processing. All these kinds of things which students with SBLDs might need a bit of extra support with. Um, so that the book is actually called Including Dyslexic Language Learners. So I would recommend that one. We usually get this question, don't we? Uh, and, and, and sometimes teachers think that older students or even teenagers may not enjoy so much these multisensory mm -hmm. activities or activities that involve movement. Um, I mean, I know that maybe teenagers can be a bit, bit more reticent with singing, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. but, but I, I, in my experience, they, they seem to find a lot of these multisensory activities helpful. Absolutely. The, the adults that I've worked with, both, both in groups and individually, um, love to play games, to have competitions, quizzes, um, to do quite active tasks. Um, I, I don't see much difference really. You're right, teenagers sometimes have a bit of um, street cred that they need to protect, you know, they have to, they have quite fragile egos at that age, I think, and they're trying to be cool. But I think adults, once they've got over that, yeah, I think they're mostly happy to try anything. Um, I have found that adults, of course, will tell you outright if they don't want to. <laughs> So you'll yeah. know if it's not right for your students because they'll tell you. But generally, yeah, I do think multisensory activities work for, for everybody. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Do we know no more questions? Um, I think we have time for maybe one 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 reserve question. So perhaps about exams because yeah. I know exams is a really big issue, and there have been comments through the course. For example, when we've been talking about activities we can do in class. And somebody said, well, it's great in class and we can make all the accommodations in class, but 
what happens when they come for the exam? Yes, um, and we didn't have too much time to talk about that in the materials. When, when, this, when, when again, it very much depends on the context because you can work in a context when there are strict external exams, no accommodations to students whatsoever, mm -hmm. and then basically what you teach is dictated by the exams that the students have to take, and then I know that. And unfortunately, there is not much you can do in those contexts other than A, lobby for the exam not dictating the curriculum and B, for a more inclusive environment and giving more, what you can do is to giving just more opportunities for the students to practice, to, to prepare for the exam, thinking over their exam taking strategies. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I absolutely acknowledge that there are situations where, where you cannot do that. Um, there are situations, for example, when you put together as a teacher the exam mm -hmm. uh, or the, the test on which you assess. And, and unfortunately, teachers don't have a lot of assessment literacy, and this is something that colleagues here in Lancaster are also um, working on. But I think if you consider what inclusive teaching is like, then it's important to develop testing tasks that are also inclusive, so the activities that we've been talking about that are helpful for teaching students, they are also helpful for, for assessment. And when you set up the assessment, think about the, the environment, uh, are there any distractions, is the lighting uh, appropriate, uh, then think about the time that, that you are giving to the students, is it going to be enough? Uh, for them to complete the task. Think about whether you can differentiate and where there, whether there's any way of differentiation uh, within the exam, whether there is any choice in the, in the task. Can, can't you have one, one area of language that you test with three different types of tasks and the students choose which one they would do. Um, and, and then giving accommodations based on the student's need, maybe just oral assessment instead of the written assessment. Um, um, reading aloud to the student instead of just um, um, asking them to, to read it. Um, some students might need software for typing, um, and that's really helpful. Breaking up the time. Yes, breaks. Yes, yeah. breaks are mm -hmm. very important. Think about how much time the student can take and again, mm -hmm. kind of concentrate. Um, so I think that there are things that you can do as a teacher, and there are also um, if your school sets up an exam, again, that's something that you should be the advocate. Um, that mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, should, the, the exam should be more, uh, more inclusive. And I think also think about the feedback you give and the score, uh, scoring, um, and that the feedback should, should, of course, you should give an honest evaluation of where the student is, mm -hmm. but you should also be constructed into where they can improve or how they could improve mm -hmm. uh, and think about what is some what is important to highlight as an error and what is not so important to to highlight so i think it's it's important to think about assessment not just teaching mm. um, absolutely yeah and um, one of the questions which we're often asked is um whether it changes then the value of the certificate that they get if the students have um, access arrangements, accommodation, or whether it changes what you're actually testing? In some cases, yes. So uh, there was a time when, for example, um, one of the major international exam providers had the opportunity of being exempted from spelling, and then it was an access arrangement, and it's, it, it was stated on the uh, certificate. And obviously, um, that shows that, that you were not assessed on certain of the exam and it, it changes the meaning of the score and if it's a standardized exam it can change what you're testing um, but again the question is uh, how the student will use that knowledge later in, in, in real yeah. life um, what's the purpose of the yeah, exam that's the purpose of the exam yeah. mm -hmm. um, just going back to your point about standardization um, I'm very very often asked uh, in the UK um, about how we can arrange accommodation and exams for students who have English as an additional language. Um, the JCQ, so I'm kind of talking to British teachers at the moment, the JCQ is the, the body that um, oversee all of the exam arrangements across the country and they are very clear that exam arrangements can only be put in place for students who are experiencing difficulties 
not due to the language difference. So first of all, you've got to figure out if it is a language issue or if it is an underlying cognitive difference like a specific learning difference. And then they really want standardised scores, which is really problematic because we don't have any standardised tests for EAL learners in this country. All our tests are based on English language. So that's a real, that's always a conundrum, it's always an issue. Um, but I just wanted to come back to what you were saying about lobbying, because I do think that the more teachers who get in touch with the JCQ and ask them and keep asking them, eventually they're going to have to take it seriously and think through the issues. So there's a little appeal from me. If you are a teacher in a British school trying to get exam arrangements for your EAL learners, please keep asking the JCQ if they really need a standard score and why they need a standard score when it's not valid. Yes. Keep lobbying. We'll get there in the end. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, just to speak about international exam providers, I've been working with, with some already, mm -hmm. looking at their testing practices and how they can make the tests more accessible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is, there is a need, uh, even in the language exam word, um, like um, Cambridge and, and some other mm -hmm. exam providers, are really interested in making their exams more accessible. There is more awareness, isn't there, amongst the exam providers, which is really heartening. Yeah. We've got a little way to go. Yes. <laughs> We're making progress. Okay. Slowly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think that if there are no more questions, then I think we'll, we'll conclude our little uh, live, uh, our live um, um, question and answer session. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to kind of, um, as a word of, um, of, um, of goodbye, I think what is important is, is that you, as we were saying, it really depends. So just to reflect on, on what works in your context, because we can't give you advice that is applicable everywhere. There's nothing that works for everybody. There is nothing that works for everybody. There are different mm -hmm. cultures, there are different contexts in which it should be work, um, different levels of education. So just reflect on what works for you, what works for your students, mm -hmm. and what doesn't work. And, and there are no rules of how to be mm -hmm. inclusive. Inclusion is a process, and, and teachers can play a very active role in it. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope that by taking this MOOC, you will become kind of little ambassadors of, yeah. uh, of inclusion all over the world. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Hubert. Yes. Thank you very much for Thank you. following us and listening to us. And there are still a couple of more days left in the course. Yes. So we'll try to answer see any other questions. Yes, see you online.